Genesis 6 and 5 through 7. You'll remember them when I begin reading. The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and had grieved him to his heart. So the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the ground, man and beast and creeping things and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. And then you remember in chapter 7 and 21 through 23 is the historical event of the flood. And verse 21 of chapter 7, And all flesh died that moved upon the earth, birds, cattle, beasts, all swarming creatures that swarm upon the earth, and every man, everything on the dry land in whose nostrils was the breath of life died. He blotted out every living thing that was upon the face of the ground, man and animals and creeping things and birds of the air. They were blotted out from the earth. Why did God react that way? I ask that because we ourselves are living in a society whose Supreme Court has described that kind of action as a cruel and inhuman punishment. So that's why I think it's a problem to many of us, why God reacted that way. When our own Supreme Court describes capital punishment as a, an inhuman punishment, then why did God react that way? And you know that most of us who have come through our educational system recently have been encouraged to think in that way. You must admit, most of us have the kind of predisposition to believe that there is no evil so absolutely evil that the only thing you can do is destroy it. We really have been encouraged not to think that way. And yet you must admit that in practical affairs that concern our own lives, we do believe that there is some evil that is so bad that the only thing you can do is destroy it. For instance, we believe that certain clothing that uh, are impregnated with any plague or contaminated with any disease, all you can do with that clothing at times is to burn it and destroy it. We obviously believe it with much of our radioactive material. That's why we dump a lot of it in the deepest depths of the ocean. Because we believe there is certain material and there are certain things that are so bad that you can't do anything but destroy them. And it is interesting that certain governors and presidents who are responsible for deterring society from destroying itself obviously think in the same kind of way. They think that there is certain evil that is so bad that you have to destroy it before it destroys us. And yet you know that we have been encouraged to think that there is no evil that is so absolutely exclusive of good that all you can do is destroy it. You know we have been encouraged to think that it's kind of primitive and bourgeois to believe that you have to destroy something, that you cannot actually redeem it. And we kind of have begun to think that there is no black and white, that there are shades of grey, and that there are no things just as bad as that. And yet, we can see that if you carry this to its ultimate conclusion, eventually society itself would not exist if we continue to think in these terms. We have begun to see that there must be something that is worth preserving. And there must be a moral authority somewhere in the universe that you have to try to preserve if we're not all to take part in destruction of one another. There was a movie, uh, or a really lovely, one of those beautiful movies, 
that uh, uh, are taken off much faster than Deep Throat, you know. And it's one of the, just one of the beautiful movies with uh, Walter Matthau, and it was called Koch. And it was the story of an old grandfather. And oh, it's just beautiful, and really was a great help to us. And Koch, uh, at one point, uh, remembered some lines of Latin that he learned at school. And it ran, quis custodiet custodies. And it means, who will protect the protectors? And I think that's it, Jones. That obviously men like Nixon and Rockefeller, however much we may disagree with them on other issues, obviously they have begun to see that if you don't protect the law enforcers, then eventually you come to a place where anything goes. And if you don't make the destruction of policemen and prison guards a no-no, an absolute no-no that receives punishment that is capital, uh, the capital death penalty, then eventually you get into a society where nobody cares about anything. And so obviously, brothers and sisters, somewhere along the line, you have to get the buck to stop being passed. Somewhere along the line, you have to settle and decide Look, there's something that is so bad that you have to stop it however you stop it. And I think many of us are slowly beginning to see that and even the psychologists, it seems, are beginning to see it too. That there are some things that are so bad that you really have to act to stop them. Now, if you want to see the disease that you and I are in at the moment, you only had to watch Archie last night. And you saw the disease, didn't you? You know? We will look after ourselves. The girl was almost raped, but we will look after her reputation. And okay, the fellow may go out and rape others, but we want to keep the dignity of our own family intact. And that's how far this kind of disease has gone, you know. Where we've so lost the sense of absolutes, we've so lost the feeling that there's anything worth putting your life on the line for, that now we're being driven back in our cities, into apartment blocks where we have security systems on them and we just lock ourselves up in our little caves. And we're getting back to the old caveman business, you know. You lock yourself up and you keep your gun on your bedside table and you don't let anybody into you. Now, loved ones, do you see that that comes when we believe that there is no evil so absolutely evil that it has to be destroyed. Now, obviously, God did not think that way at all. You can see that. On the basis of that piece of history that we've just read, and on the basis of the evidence of an alluvial layer of rock throughout the world, that is, geological evidence for a flood, and on the basis of the attitude of Jesus to the Old Testament history, obviously there came a time when God decided, this is so evil that all I can do is destroy it if I'm going to preserve anything at all. And that's really what we're reading about when we read about that flood. That God obviously believes there is some evil that is confrontable only with destruction. And that's the only way you can deal with it. Now what is that evil? Or what are those attitudes? Well, the attitudes that God felt were so bad that they had to be destroyed were summed up by the writer of an article in the Minneapolis Star last year. He did an article on a survey that he carried out on students at the U who were graduating that year. And uh, he was trying to find out the motives that were guiding them in their choice of jobs. And he summarized the motives under three categories. Uh, Profit, power, success. And those were the three things that were guiding the majority of students who graduated from the U last year in their choice of jobs. They were going for jobs that give them profit, or they wanted a job that gave them power or influence, or they wanted a job that gave them a feeling of success and enjoyment. Now, those are the three attitudes that the creator of the world set out to destroy by that flood. Those are three attitudes that deal with the three areas of our soul, the will and the mind and the emotions. And those are the three attitudes that if they're allowed to wildcat throughout the universe, will eventually destroy the universe and destroy all of us, really. They're they're the attitudes mentioned 
in that verse that we've looked at often, you know, if you refer back to Genesis 3 and 6. Genesis 3 and 6. And these are the attitudes, really, that the psychologists confirm make the wheels of industry and commerce turn. That most executives are governed and uh, driven by these three desires or these three needs. And you find them there in Genesis 3 and 6. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband and he ate. Now, it was because of those three motives or desires that we decided to set up our own standards of good and evil and decide what was good and evil for ourselves. Now, you can see them there. You see in verse 6, the woman saw that the tree was good for food. The desire to have our own way and get what we wanted, what we want, whatever it costs anybody else. The desire to get things. And that it was a delight to the eyes. Uh, the desire for enjoyment and for happiness and to enjoy ourselves whatever it really costs anyone else and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise the desire to use our minds to manipulate people and circumstances to our advantage and those are just those three same motives the need for profit, power and success now the reason those drives are so powerful is that God did make us with a need for security. We really do have a need for security. We don't need all the food in the world, but we do need security. We don't need all the clothing in the world, but we do need security. He made us with a need for security. So that is God-given. He made us with a need for happiness. So that is a thing that's God-given. That's why it's so strong a desire in each of us. He made us a desire, he gave us a desire to use our minds to bring things into order. So that is a God-given thing. Now, brothers and sisters, that's why those drives are so powerful in themselves. But it was God's intention to satisfy all those by giving us the supernatural life power of his Holy Spirit. And he planned that we would have all those things satisfied by that. But you remember that we determined to do it without his life power, And so we began to try to satisfy these things by our own wits. So you remember, many of us have dedicated our lives to uh, achieving security for ourselves. We've given ourselves over to getting all the food and all the clothing and all the shelter we can possibly need in this life. And often, many of us, by excessive life insurance policies, are determined to try to insure it for not only our children, but our grandchildren, as many generations after that. And so as a result of the way we have given vent to that desire in the three and a half billion people in the world, there is an absolutely unjust and unfair distribution of wealth and food. And it's because we're driven by that desire to achieve security in the way that we want, to get what we want when we want it. We're the same with the desire for happiness, you know. We have such a desire to enjoy ourselves that we don't care who else we destroy. We don't care who else has happiness destroyed. As long as we are happy, we'll do anything for an extra kick or an extra thrill or some sense of exhilaration. Whoever body suffers or whatever person has their own emotions destroyed. And it's the same, you know, with the mind. We're so determined to use our mind to manipulate circumstances and people to our advantage that we leave everybody else without a free will except us. Now, do you see that when you take billions of minds, emotions, and wills that are bent on that kind of attitude, you've got a problem on your hands. If you've got three and a half million minds, three and a half billion minds trying to manipulate each other for the individual satisfaction and happiness, you've got chaos. And when God looked at three and a half billion of us, using our personalities and our attitudes and our abilities in that way, he knew there was nothing to do but destroy us absolutely. And so you remember what he did. He withdrew his Holy Spirit from us so that at least we would not be able to live infinitely and eternally. And so we wouldn't be able to destroy his world and his universe continually. And then you remember he destroyed us and put all those minds, emotions and wills with all those drives for security and happiness and for manipulation of others into his son Jesus, and he destroyed them on Calvary. 
And you remember we saw last Sunday, that's why he as a holy God is able to offer us again an opportunity to receive the Holy Spirit. Because his justice has been satisfied by destroying the evil that was in all of us. And you remember we called that the atonement. We said that Jesus atoned for all our rebellion against God by actually dying for us. And allowing God to put all these tremendously strong drives into him and destroy them there. And we said that that made us at one with God. It put us right with our Creator. So that we really felt a great sense of acceptance with him. At last he had done what he knew had to be done. He had destroyed the evil that we had produced in the world. And so he was free to accept us as his children. And it brought a great sense of justification to us when we began not only to believe that, but to receive the Holy Spirit into us. This life power that he had originally given us. And it has saved a lot of us from trying to get the acceptance of our peers any longer. Now, dear ones, here's the problem that many of us face. There are many of us here this morning in the theater who really do know that God has forgiven us. And we really have received the life of his Holy Spirit into us. And we really do believe that we're justified in God's eyes. But there are many of us here who have still incredible problems and troubles with those selfish, willful desires for security, happiness, and manipulation of others. We just still have that problem. We have received the Holy Spirit. There are many of us who are Christians here this morning, but we still find that those drives are alive within us. That we're driving still to get security by other means and by other ways. We still have problems with greed and covetousness about clothes and food. Many of us still have trouble with gluttony and with sexual desires. Many of us still have trouble with a tremendous desire to enjoy ourselves emotionally, whoever it hurts. Many of us still have difficulties with the desire of this old mind to manipulate us to the top of the heap. Whatever it costs anybody else, whoever we have to trample over to get the best job. In other words, there are many of us who really have received the Holy Spirit into ourselves. But we still find we have problems with these strong drives. The strong drives of this selfish will. It's outlined there, you know, in Galatians 5 and 17. It kind of describes quite well the situation that many of us find ourselves in in our own personal lives. Galatians 5 and 17. For the desires of the flesh, and the flesh is not the sexual part of us, you know, or even the physical body. The desires of the flesh are the independent selfish will that we have. If you rearrange the letters of flesh and leave out one of them, you get the word self. And it's really the desires of the flesh, the self. The desires of the selfish will are against the spirit. And the desires of the spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to prevent you from doing what you would. And there are many of us who have received the Holy Spirit and really are justified in God's eyes. And yet we have problems in this area. These drives seem to be still alive and active inside us. And that's why, you see, Paul says a few verses later there in verse 25 of chapter 5, if we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. And Paul says, listen, if you're born of the Spirit, if you've received the Holy Spirit into you, if you're justified in God's eyes, why not walk by that Spirit? But many of us find that we cannot. We find, yeah, I do want to walk by the Spirit. I want to depend on this supernatural life force of the Holy Spirit to give me all the joy I want, but I find something inside me wants to get more joy. I want to trust the Holy Spirit to give me the food and the clothing and the money that I need, but I find there's another drive inside me that wants to get all that I want, and more if possible than God even wants for me. And so many of us have found that those kind of drives work against each other. We want to depend on the Holy Spirit, but we find ourselves falling back into these old drives for profit, power, and success that govern the ordinary person who has re never received God's Spirit. Now, why is this? Because you and I think of Jesus' death 
and of our being destroyed in him as a beautiful idea. That's it. When we read about God destroying all those drives for profit, power and success in Jesus, we think of that as a neat little analogy. We say, yeah, that's a nice way to think about how a holy God had to get satisfaction for his justice. Mind you, we think God's a wee bit silly. We think he's a bit silly accepting one man's death for other people's death. I mean, that seems unjust. Why punish one person for somebody else's mis- misdoing? And so, deep, deep down, we think, uh, we better humor him. This is a strange kind of justice he has, but we'll humor him. And it is a nice thought. It's a nice illustration. Yes, Lord, you're right. Uh, uh, you put us all into Jesus. Okay, we believe that. And you destroyed us all there. And now you're prepared to forgive us and to give us your Holy Spirit. Now, brothers and sisters, the tragedy is that throughout those of you who have been to church over a great part of your lives. The tragedy is that most of us have heard that presented as a nice little illustration. A nice little method God has of giving himself an excuse for forgiving us. We don't see that God really did destroy us in Jesus. That God is one who lives in the world that Einstein described where there is no past and there is no present and there is no future, where there is just one great present eternity, there is just one great moment. And we fail to see that that mighty God, who is in a part of the universe who can see all things as happening now that happened 3,000, 4,000, 5 million years ago, and that will happen 50 years hence, that great God actually did take your drive for profit, power and success and did put them into his son Jesus and did actually destroy them objectively by the power of his spirit. And that's why he's willing to forgive us. Loved ones, God's justice demands that those things be destroyed. He can't just pretend, you know. He can't just pretend. He's not a silly God. He can't just pretend and say, oh yeah, I pretend I've destroyed them in Jesus and so now I'll treat all these people as if they were really good even though they aren't. No, the only reason God can treat us as good is that he has already destroyed all the evil that we produced. And really that's what God tries to get over to us again and again in the Bible. But we keep saying, oh well, it's a nice illustration. Now obviously... If you live in the world of time and space, that couldn't happen. He couldn't destroy the selfish desire or the lustful desire that I have at this moment. Loved ones, don't you see that it's silly to think in terms of time and space? Don't you think that, don't you see that even you yourselves transcend time? If I ask you, uh, can you remember a year ago? Can you remember 10 years ago? Can you remember 15 years ago? You know that there is really very little degree of difference in the vividness of your memory. You know that things ten years ago, if they were important things or had emotional import to you, you can remember those as well as you can remember things last week. Even in our own time-space lives, we can begin to see that time actually, in a sense, does not exist. You know how difficult it is for you to decide whether last week went slowly or fast. You know that it's purely relative. That the clock says it goes at the same speed, but you yourself know that it went faster or slower according to the things that you were doing last week. In other words, even we ourselves see that time and space does not exist. Now, in God's mind and in God's eternal world, he is able actually to destroy the drives that are making mincemeat out of your lives at present. Now, that's what God said again and again through Jesus' apostles. You know, If, if you look at it, just one of the instances in 2 Corinthians 5 and 14. 2 Corinthians 5 and 14. It's page 1006. 1006. 2 Corinthians 5 and 14. For the love of Christ controls us Because we are convinced that one has died for all. Most of us, you see, kind of accept that. And we say, yeah, Jesus died for us. That's what enabled him to bring us the atonement, to atone for our rebellion against God and to make us at one with God. Therefore, all have died. 
And that's the second bit that we so rarely realize is true. That when Jesus died for us, he was able to do that because we actually were all put into him and destroyed with him. And that's why God's justice was satisfied. There are spiritual powers that God released as we release certain x-rays into a thing like cancer to destroy it. So God released certain spiritual powers against the drives for profit, power and success that destroy our present lives. And he destroyed them in Jesus. And really, you see, that's what Paul is saying in this verse that we're studying today. And that's why I explained it before I asked you to read it. It's page 981 in that black RSV. And it's Romans 6 and verse 3. Because so many of us read it. And we just immediately under-interpret it the moment we read it. That's why, you see, Paul says in Romans 6 and verse 3, Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? And brothers and sisters, this was the beginning of life for me in my own Christian experience. This Romans 6 was the beginning of life for me in a life that had been utterly unsatisfying and defeated as as a Christian. And then gradually I began to see that this was true. That Jesus atoned for my sins because he actually allowed me to die with him by faith. And if I'd had to die physically or eternally, I'd have been wiped out immediately. But God was allowing me to die by faith. To die, as it were, by proxy in Jesus. And the moment I was willing to enter into that and accept it, that moment the Holy Spirit was able to destroy those drives for profit, power and success that governed my whole life. But for years, brothers and sisters, I didn't believe that we had anything to do with Jesus' death. I knew that it was because of his death that God was willing to forgive us. But I never saw that the real reason for that was because we had actually taken part in his death. That instead of sending another flood, God sent Jesus and put us all into Jesus and destroyed us there. And that that can actually be made real in our own individual, personal, subjective experiences today. The moment we're willing to let that happen in us. So brothers and sisters, this is some of the deeper teaching really that God is beginning to take us into in Romans 6. And it concerns the whole business of living like a Christian. Not just being a Christian, but how to live like a Christian. And I think what God wants us to begin to do over these next years is to begin to see in what way you and I are prepared to take Jesus' death as a lovely analogy, as a neat illustration of a holy God demanding satisfaction for his justice, or whether we're really prepared to believe that God did actually destroy us in Jesus and destroyed those drives for profit, power, and success. And you know, over these next Sundays and over the next years, will try to elaborate and draw out all the meaning of this. It obviously doesn't mean he destroyed our personalities. Obviously doesn't mean he destroyed our bodies. But obviously he destroyed the things that are troubling you and me. And what is the proof that they needed to be destroyed? Your own failure to control your temper. How many years have you been trying to control your temper? How many years have you been trying to keep down lust? How many years have you tried to keep down that envy and jealousy in your heart? Isn't that indication, dear ones, that this is something so powerful and so evil that only a creator of the world can deal with it? You can't suffocate those things. They really have to be destroyed. And I really thank God that he has done it. You know, and that it can be made real in our lives by the Holy Spirit. Let us pray. Father, we would trust you to give us the light of your Holy Spirit as we begin to go into the deep things now that you want us to share. Father, we remember that it was when Jesus started to talk this way that a great many turned away from him and stopped following. Father, we do not want to be among that number. We want not only to be Christians in name so that we're only hypocrites, but we want to be Christians in life, our Father. 
We want your world to begin to see Jesus alive in us. So, Lord, we trust you to give us patience as we go into these deep teachings and these deep truths. We trust you most of all to show us the great need for them in our own lives this coming week. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.